Hello, hello. Um, welcome to our third episode on decolonizing dramaturgy. Um, really excited to be here again today um, uh, for many reasons. Uh, first of all, is that I've been receiving lots of uh, emails, um, uh, really those that are watching and those that watch later, um, really sending a lot of great comments and, and, and um, encouragement. And that's very helpful. I know I'm not a radio presenter, I'm not a TV presenter, um, but it's just very interesting when when people start engaging with what with the content. And so I just want to say thank you. I keep that coming. Um, uh, really, really, really appreciate the opportunity to to be part of this. My name is Taiwo Afolabi, um, and um, I'm really excited today to be uh, talking with three amazing uh, scholar, practitioner, director, a playwright, actor uh, from different part of the world. Um, I'm dialing to you today from um, the uh, from Regina uh, here at the University of Regina here in, uh, in Saskatchewan, Canada. Uh, and I want to really acknowledge wherever you are. Uh, thank you for coming uh, from uh, all over the world, seeing this now and those that will be seeing this later. Today, um, it's really an opportunity to really explore with uh, Jude, um, Fumi, and, and Aganser, and they're gonna introduce themselves very soon. I'm not gonna introduce them because I think there's something interesting about the introduction, first of all. But before I call them to introduce themselves, I just wanna also mention that, um, a, a quick recap. The first episode, we, uh, Fumi and I, try to, we try to situate the discourse of dramaturgy within the context of uh, Africa and what that means when theater maker, makers from the continent um, uh, really speak about that. And wh wh what do we mean by decolonizing uh, dramaturgy? And last week, we also had um, uh, guests from, from Egypt, from Nigeria, and from Zimbabwe really discussing dramaturgical skills and what that means and what are other big ideas that you know, the concept of what we're engaging with kind of offer us to discourse. Today, we're gonna to be exploring the idea of self-dramaturgy and dramaturging with others. Dramaturgy, uh, dramaturg as a nurturer. I'd like to quickly appreciate all our uh, partners, uh, Pan-African Creative Exchange, and they're doing a great job with your dramaturgical um, lab, uh, which for me is uh, one of the coordinators and I'm really excited. I have a session with them on, on Saturday. Uh, also thanks to HowlRound, um, really exciting uh, partnership. Uh, thanks to Theatre Industry International uh, in Nigeria. Thanks to SafeWorld um, in Canada. Um, and of course, to the University of Regina. Um, so I'd like to start today uh, by really asking um, the three of our guests to introduce themselves. And what we'll do is once you do yours, just pass the button to um, the next and to the third person. And maybe we'll just ask uh, Jude, Jude Idada to start. Speak your truth, dub well. Let's go, Jude. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, everyone. My name is Jude Idada. Um, welcome to this platform. Um, yeah, so um, who is Jude? Um, Jude is a 360 artist. Um, I write, I direct, I produce. So that being said, I work on several platforms. I'm multi-platformed. So I work on stage, um, I work on um, film as it were, and then the printed text, which is books. 
Um, I had my first degree at the University of Ibadan, the only university in Nigeria, <laughs> Banon. And um, <laughs> I, I'm sorry, um, Tyro, for busting your bubbles. Okay. <laughs> um, I did theater arts um, after a journey that took me from other courses before I settled into my natural calling. Um, I have um, several published books, um, eight as at now. Um, I've won a couple of awards, uh, the Nigeria Prize for Literature, Ama, Anna, and the rest. Um, I'm here to share the little that I know. I have been actively engaged in the theater space, both as a published playwright and as a director of um, plays that I have written and directing other people's works. I live in Canada, um, Toronto to be exact. That's the only city in Canada. <laughs> and then, <laughs> and then in Lagos, which also happens to be the only city in Nigeria. <laughs> so yeah, so I, I, I try to um, look at art as a very spiritual um, profession uh, with certain talents and uh, like vessels that are sweet are calling. Um, the kind of art I immerse um, is art that adds value, um, that has um, elements of activism and all of that. As my MLK said, um, so we spoke earlier about what are the art forms we create, what they can do. So yes, I'm here hope that um, this session will be as light in viewing as possibly can. Thank you. So I had on to the I think you keep pressing on to me. Yeah. I said I heard the ah uh at the end, <laughs> and I knew that wasn't for me. <laughs> Uh, thank you, Jude. I think he's dropped off. Um, wow. And now he's back. Wow. Thank you, Taiwo, for welcoming us to this platform. Welcome, everyone, to this wonderful conversation, which I am excited about. My name is Aganza Chisaka. I am from Uganda. I'm an actress, a producer, a director, a playwright and now a teacher, this, which is an area I like to hide, but I am a teacher and I'll explain why very soon. Uh, I studied at New York University in Abu Dhabi, theater arts with a minor in psychology. So I love studying people and I love acting them as well. I have a master's in education. And so now I teach acting voice and and movement, of course, I was going to say dance, but that's, that's not it, it's movement. Uh, my, my work is quite diverse. I've had a lot of opportunity to work as an actress first, and that has led me into other areas. And so I approach most of my work from an acting perspective. I approach my directing from an acting perspective and in the opportunities where I get to be or act as a dramaturg, I wouldn't call myself a dramaturg or work with a dramaturg, I approach it also from an acting perspective and I'm looking forward to contributing to this conversation. Thank you. And pass it on to for me. Hello. Um, hello, everyone. I was about to say good evening, but uh, you might not be <laughs> might not be evening where you are. Um, so my name is Fumi Adewale. I'm really excited to be here. And uh, thanks to Taiwan Howround for having us. Um, I'm a senior lecturer in dance at a university in England called De Montfort University. And besides uh, teaching dance, um, I teach dance with an African basis in the university. But besides that, I'm also a dramaturg and I work mainly with choreographers who mix African forms with um, different other types of genres on stage or theater makers who mix different genres to create their work. And um, people sometimes call them interdisciplinary theater makers, for example. I still perform as a 
a storyteller. Um, so I do some one one woman performances. Um, and um, so I'm a dramaturg, performer and a lecturer. But I began, um, I began as a journalist and then went into TV production and taught for a number of years before I went into education. And that experience of working um, it, as a performer on stage really fuels everything I do. It, feel, it fuels my academic work. Um, I actually write my scholar, scholarly work from, from the position of what it's like to be a performer. And as a dramaturg, that helps me understand where the performers are going from, or coming from, sorry. So that's me, thank you. Interesting, you, the three of you, you have these diverse um, perspectives, backgrounds and practice. So I think my first question, um, that a, a prompt is really what does dramaturgy mean to you? Or how do you conceptualize it? Whether Pwaganza that you take everything from the acting perspective, from an actor's perspective, or for Jude, who is all over the various levels. And of course, for Fumi, who is a dramaturg, specifically dance dramaturg, uh, and then teaching dramaturgy and dramaturgical skills, and then acting and all of that. How, how do you all conceptualize, conceive and talk about it. And what what does that what does that look like for you? And maybe you can give us examples from your work. I know that you you all have amazing you know work out there. And and maybe we can start. Um, we can go other way. Maybe for me, can start and we go to Aganza and then to you. Well, dramaturgy. You know, it's a, like we discussed in the first episode, um, Taiwo. It's a very wide. It's very broad uh, concept and. It means different things in different places and different areas of the industry. Um, actually, dance dramaturgy is quite new to the game. I think it start, all started with playwrights. Um, and so when it came into dance, it was addressing a different set of issues than in, in plays. But I, I, I see it as, and I'm, well, I come from the school of thought because I'm not the only person who sees it this way as looking for the logic in a piece. When, it, when you're making a piece, it's looking for that logic in it and seeing what you want to foreground. Um, Jude used that word earlier, what, you know, what he decides to put in the foreground, what he decides to put in the background. Because in a performance, we're not only using words, we're also using a, a lot of imagery, costume speaking, music speaking. So there's different ways you can pass the message across which goes beyond text and the language. So what do you foreground? How do you foreground uh, your, uh, the, the meaning you want to produce? And how does that meaning go take the audience on a journey? But dramaturgy, as we were, um, Aganza brought up some issues earlier and we were talking about dramaturgy as how does your play or performance make sense in a particular locale? Um, she was talking about some things in Uganda and sometimes certain dramaturgs work in the area of marketing. You could say marketing or audience development or public relations where they're making sure that that piece of work can be accepted or received um, or, or the reception is somehow managed or framed um, as well. So a dramaturg might work on that end of things, you know, dealing with program notes, uh, dealing with Q&A, um, dealing with the media, um, dealing with the academy, so that the work is uh, this work is received from the perspective or or the dialogue around the work is the kind of dialogue the producers want. So, uh, and the layers of meaning are not, you know, are not um, hijacked by other bodies because you might bring out a play and there's there's a, a certain protest group that might actually try and take over the meaning of your play, you know. So you you <laughs> you, you 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 protect your work. So dramaturgy has to do with a, a lot to do with meaning making. I would say, in my experience, yeah. Aganza, and and we're gonna once Aganza is done, I'm gonna I'm gonna tweak that question for Jude a little bit so that we can kind of go to that background, foreground, and midground because I love him to speak about that. I know for me as the author on that, we'll go over to Aganza uh, first of all. I'll tweak that question for Jude in in a sec once Jude, uh, Aganza is over. Yeah, I think for me you covered a great breadth of what I also agree. Dramaturgy is about. I would continue and say that. 
the dramaturg protects the authenticity of the play, protects the director from themselves. As a, I'm going to speak more from a theater perspective, I allowed you to cover the whole film area because <laughs> he has more experience there. But as a director, I find myself either destroying the work or destroying my own interpretation of the work just because I'm a creative. And I, I use destroy in a very you know, shallow sort of nice way you know, let's have this and let the lights go yellow at this section of the play and, and that the intermission, this shall happen. And the dramaturg keeps you in line, keeps the play of authentic and true to what you originally wanted it to be, whether as a playwright or as a director, um, and sort of keeps the whole process together. So in, I'll name a dramaturg as, as a protector. Uh, in my own work, I uh, worked with Karishma Bagani, and I believe Tai will you be speaking to her in the ne next episode. And she was so helpful in the process uh, of a play in just making sure that I was asking the actors the right questions, not just myself, but the actors the right questions um, throughout the play. And sometimes dramaturgs stop at the conceptualization and the readings and reading rehearsal table readings of a play but it's also nice to have a dramaturg who walks you through the entire process right into the blocking and final rehearsal just to make sure that we remember the original intent of the play when we go onto stage because you know how rehearsals go things change Things change. We have jokes along the way. So I would call a dramaturg a protector. That's how I've experienced them lately. Uh, thank you again. The protector, uh, someone that maintains the authenticity of the, of, of the piece. Uh, Jude, yeah. I, I want to come back to you. you. You did, at the beginning, you were talking about the idea of background, mid-ground, foreground, um, how do you conceptualize the matter in your work? Okay, um, thanks about Tyro. Um, for me, um, unlike um, Maganza or Fumi, I've never worked with a drama dramaturg, never. So I've always self-dramaturged myself. Right. And because of that, I have been able to um, find um, an ammo on how do I engage my work or how do I engage whatever work it is that I'm directing. I have to learn when to distance myself, when to disengage so that there is the, how will I put it? There is a clear cut delineation between what I am, what I want, what I see, what the text is and what's the truth of the text as written and the messages as contained. <clears throat> so what I do is that I'm always starting from that place of the wise, wise. So even actors that have worked with me, Charles and the rest, they're always like, ah, Jude, man, you're always asking those wise. And I think the wise, if there was a dramaturg, that's what they would do. I'm always saying, so why are we doing this? Why was it written like this? Why is this? What is the context? Where is the place? So they tell me, they say, Jude, man, you give us historical lectures. You're always telling us about this and that because I have to do it. I have to put, I have to provoke the dialogue. I have to provoke the searching of the truth of the text so that there is that very similitude in the work as when it finally um, is presented in front of the audience. I think I have to speak slow. I'm sure that was the notes you guys gave. So I'm speaking slower now, <laughs> so that <laughs> so that you know there's a connection with the audience and there is um, perfect um, communication. Which of course we know communication is perfect when there is feedback, feedback that is instantaneous or feedback that is carried um, over. So when we finally find that truth, based on asking the whys, based on starting provoking a conversation, um, then we now have to decide how will the truth or the thematic concern or the central dramatic question of this work, how can we present it? And in trying to present it, that is where we come to the foreground, midground, and background. We say every work of art, am I speaking slow enough? <laughs> we say <laughs> every work of art is supposed to entertain, hopefully, and inspire or empower, right? 
So where do we put this central dramatic question? Do we put it in the background? Is it contentious enough that we do not want to put it in the foreground? We don't want to put it right on the nose because do we want to extend or delay the reaction of the consumers, the audience to this play? Is it a play that you know, is high in emotive content? Is it a play that people can just leave the theater and just go burn down some house? You know what I mean? When you know the kind of material you are dealing with, then you start deciding where do I position the central dramatic question? Do I put it in the background so that it is, it is not what is they see, it is not what they hear, but subliminally it is there. It's continually resounding. And how again are we going to choose or what kind of medium are we going to use to, um, to sell it to the audience? Will it be nonverbal? Will it be verbal? Will it be musical? Will it be dance? Will it even be with the lighting structures and technical and all of that stuff? So those are kind of things that I do. But in answering your questions, as your question as regards how do I choose it? I choose it based on that fact, based on understanding that in the positioning of the central question, central dramatic question or the central thematic concern of the play, it has a direct relation to the consummation of the work of art in itself. Foreground is right, in, it's right to the face of the audience. It's right, it's continually resounding. Background, it is more of the paradigm within which it exists. And then the midground is where the cerebral um, reverber reverberation of the play is. How do we, so, so you see a situation where I take a play, I'm, I'm sure you said something earlier, Ty, where you said you work with community, you don't work with, you are not very textual in the way you, um, you, you take your artworks into the public. Um, I have done both community theater, textual theater and all of that, and just straight improvisational theater and all of that. But I still use this as my guidelines, as being able to be three in one, not have to be the audience, I have to be the dramaturg, I have to be the director writer if it is my own work, or I have to be the personification of the writer. What is his intention? Why did he do this? In what context is it um, existing? What is the social? What is the political? What is the emotional? What is the spiritual? What are all those contexts around which the play itself is revolving? So I have to be both an academic and also a pragmatic um, professional, which is acting right into my profession. I have to be all of those things. And actors who have worked with me, lots of them, they to play up. Because they're like, okay, Jude, so we are we talk to now. Which one is, you know what I mean? Because I'm trying to tell them that, and, and it's interesting the way, or I'm trying to tell them that we all have to engage this work in order for us to present it in its truth. I, in doing that, I'm also provoke dialogues and communication and, you know, I am also dramaturgist. Amazing, uh, thanks. So Judy. they themselves, they're not just performing, they're not just becoming, you know, yeah. Oh, I thought you said, yeah, okay, so that's it. The actor themselves, they're engaging and they are, they are also helping in questioning the whys, the where, the who, the when, and the how at every single time. Why are we doing this? What was the playwright's intention? Why are we directorially cho cho choosing to represent it like this? What is the context within which it exists? What is performance? Is there anything? What is performance in itself? Is there any truth in performance? If everybody that enters into a theater, they already know that what they are coming to with um, witness is already make believe. So where is our um, allegiances? Are we trying to convince them that that which they're watching is real? Or are we trying to work along the fact that we're all doing make believe? So, so that's why I said it's, it's an academic exploration, even as it's professional. I don't want to seize time and all of that. And I need to dub someone else. So I'll <laughs> stop here. <laughs> well, thanks, Jude. Um, this is interesting because you've raised a lot of lot of a um, lot of interesting ideas as uh, same as aganza and, and of course uh, uh for me in terms of a uh, protector and the logic of the performance which i want to go back to um it, something i've kind of observed which is interesting as i'm as we, the three of you are talking is that fumi has dramaturg someone else so she's dramaturg the other another person um aganza has been dramaturged on <laughs> if that if that makes sense uh, and then Jude, you self-dramaturg. 
which is interesting. I, you know, when when I was pulling this uh, this episode together, I didn't really, you know, I I I brought three of you together just thinking, you know, but it, it never come to me like this. But then what that's the question that provokes for me then is how do you how do you make the choices that you make, Jude, when you're self-dramaturging? And then for Fumi, when you're dramaturging the other person, how do you how do you in the context of logic of the performance, how do you how do you make that logic come together in the structuration? And then for Aganza, when they're dramaturging you, how do you pick and choose? What makes what what's your like like you know to to, to dub uh, Jude? He was talking about the, the the vertex of the performance itself, right? And I hope I'm dubbing well now. Um, uh, so it just this is a, the inside joke. We just kind of say say your truth and dub well. So it just we're just joking here. Um, but Jude was talking about that idea of the vertex of the performance and knowing you know the language and you know the message you want to pass pass across and all of those things. How the three of you in your different context, um, how do you go about that? And then maybe in addition to that plot for Fumi, you were talking about institutional dramaturging, which you've also had experience about and you've had experience with. How do you go about all of that? That's my question for the three of you. Sounds yeah. silly. I, I hope that it's articulate enough. Yeah, I'll um I'll start with dramaturging someone else. Usually when I start, I ask them what they're trying to achieve, what they want to achieve. I'll make them commit it to writing. Um, I find out where they are in their career, what their trajectory is, i.e. what they're trying to, which kind of audiences. I try and make them understand there's not a general audience out there. There's not a general black audience. Because we, you know, <laughs> not every black person is thinking the same, you know? Um, so try and get them down to what kind of issues they're trying to deal with. Uh, would they define themselves in terms of their themes or their aesthetics, especially in dance? Because sometimes dancers are not using many words. And so in terms of aesthetic is, do, do you want people to um, engage with your dance on the level of is cultural renaissances, like people see the performance and they think home or they're using African perform, um, forms. So they want to think of it in terms of, oh, I recognize that I'm Yoruba or I'm from West Africa. I can see those forms. Or are you more about, um, you know, communicating concepts for movement? So even though you might be using forms from Africa, but it's more about the message you are sort of channeling through the forms that you're more interested in. So find out what they're trying to do and then um, see how they're trying to achieve it. Now, sometimes people bring you in at the, at the conception stage. They're thinking through the idea and they want someone to brainstorm who would push them in different ways and question them. Because someone questioning you gets you to think deeper and actually can speed up your, uh, speed up your processes of making the decision. You might not make the mistake, I mean, my job is not to try and get them to agree with me, but to dig deeper into themselves. And if I say, why do you want to do that? They might, uh, the idea is that they have to find an answer. So they might go and research, they might go and talk to some, but they have to come and give me an answer that I find convincing, not necessarily agree with, but I feel has conviction in it. And by that, it pushes them deeper into where, where, what they're trying to achieve with the play. So together we develop a frame as to what, what, where they're going forward. Most people, however, invite me in to fix a problem. They, they're, they're in a rehearsal, it's not working. The artistic director is not getting on with the choreographer, the, the artist, you know, the, maybe the actor and the, 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 the dancers, they're not seeing eye to eye. Maybe the director feels they're so close to the work they can't make any kind of, um, uh, you know, they, they feel they're now making decisions or they have babies they don't want to kill. It's not a nice term, but some people say you have to sometimes throw out your best, you know, the thing you really like. Maybe even the thing that inspired the piece, you now feel is not fitting into the piece again. You don't want to let go of it. And you need someone to come and say, okay, let go, let go, let go. Let me take that off you now, okay. You know, they need someone to come in and help them fix. And um, 
or they, they're trying to achieve something and they don't know how, and they don't have the time. If they had the time, they might be able to step out of the process, take off the hat of artistic director, put on the hat of movement director, come back into the process and fix it, but they don't have the time. So they need a dramaturg to just come in and help them with that. And um, for example, I worked with someone who was using text and movement and the problem this choreographer was facing is that the, the performers would dance small and after they've danced a bit, they will stop and talk. And she found the dancing and the, the, the speaking was so separate. It didn't allow the audience to suspend disbelief. And also it didn't create a, the kind of universe she wanted. So she wanted, how do we go from acting and slowly into dance and back without the audience knowing they're switching uh, art form. So I went into rehearsal, I looked at the dancers, I looked at the actors, I looked at their strengths, their weaknesses, and we started devising creative tasks. And then she started using it with the artists. And once they had got it, they actually didn't want to talk to me anymore. They wanted to get on with their production. So sometimes dramaturg is fixer, but you're trying to work in the frame of the artist. You're not the artistic director. So you're not taking over the vision of the play. You're there to support it. So maybe I should, I've talked enough, I'll come back to institutional dramaturgy later, but um, that's how I work with someone. And I'd be, I, I'm a very bad dramaturg for myself, actually, because I'm not able to switch. And um, yeah, so <laughs> I'm looking forward to hearing Jude. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm interested in that too. <laughs> uh, 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 Aganza, what, what about you that someone has done that for you? Oh, yeah, you? I'm looking forward to hearing Jude as well because I'm very bad with myself as well. I, I, I hate asking myself those tough questions and killing my darlings like Funmi was saying. That's the tough part. Um, but my experience in being dramaturged uh, is twofold. And one is an experimental theater where it was my own work. And another was when it was someone else's work and we were all new to the play. In my own work, I experienced some of the challenges that Fumi was talking about. My play was a choreo poem. So that meant it encompassed dance, poetry, music, drama, all these performance art forms. And I was, writing it as I was, you know, rehearsing it. And so my mentor at the time was asking me all these questions. And I said, I don't have the time. And so in came the dramaturg to fix the process, to help me along the process. And every decision that was made in the rehearsal room had a question, why, why are you blocking that? Why are you saying that word as opposed to that word? Why is that poem there? Why are you using that movement? Why, are you using, why aren't you using that movement? And it was irritating and it was frustrating, but she did enable the process or the play to come into a place where I understood it and I understood what I was trying to say until I was able to have an aha moment. And I said, I no longer need you. Thank you so much, deuces, <laughs> you may go. Um, but it was challenging because everything about the work was mine. The movements were mine, the poetry was mine, the blocking was mine, the cast was mine. And I'm sort of, you know, we're talking about the dramaturg as a nurturer. I'm a director and nurture. I want everything to be protected and nobody to get hurt and it's all okay. But sometimes you have to be tough with your decisions um, and tough with yourself. And the job took allows you to do that. And I was quite thankful to have her in the room there. When I was working with someone else's play, the dramaturg fitted the role of enabling the cast and crew to understand the nuances in the play, which uh, it was, it had language that wasn't familiar to us, institutionalized language. Um, it, it had col col colloquial terms that were new. It, it had uh, blocking that was unique to the spaces 
of that kind of caliber of people. So the dramaturg came in to give us knowledge, to inform us of this means this, this is actually what that joke, how that joke would go down. And so there were a lot of table reads just to have aha moments and oh, this is how we behave. Ah, this is how we hold a glass of wine. Okay, I see, I understand. So the picking and choosing in that context was quite easy because it was just telling us of what already existed and it was just a matter of understanding as opposed to pick and choose between two darlings like in my um, situation. Uh, thanks, Aganza. Jude, the, the floor is yours. Okay, everyone's waiting for me to be dubbed. Okay, so um, it's a very interesting, challenging place to be um, being very um, self, will I say self provoked to stand into roles that are not necessarily comfortable. But for me, I've always um, approached the art in the creation of the art, the presentation of the art from a very um, yeoman kind of um, a perspective where I just go ahead and I do it. And because of that, that is why I, you know, I self dramaturge and all of that. And again, the core of my, the embrace of the art for me is very spiritual. <clears throat> and that helps me, excuse me, that helps me to understand that it is not about me. It is not about my vision, my understanding and all of that, that the best interpretation of this work of art will come about. And when I say spiritual, I'm not talking about Christianity, Islam or whatever. I'm just talking about the energies or the superconscious that exists that is outside me. So when I engage the work of art, I can, I can delineate it. I can draw lines and say, this is Jude. These are the borders within which you, you, you work. This is Jude. That is Jude the person, Jude the director, Jude the playwright. And Jude, just like what um, Aganza said, Jude the nurturer, the one who really wants to midwife everybody, including myself for us to be able to, because yeah, you have to be merciful to yourself sometimes, for us to be able to, together in a very collective way, um, um, bring about this work to the best way possible it can. So how do, I, how, how do I do it? I'm a research buff. So when I first engage the work, I read it, then I go, I find a context within which it exists, being that, you know, on the bigger perspective, time, you know, time in terms of period and all of that, cultural norms, um, ethical mores, and all of that. So I go back, I leave the work and I go back and I do my work on that. So when I'm doing my work as a researcher, I'm doing it from a place of a provocateur. As I said, for me, as I said earlier, for me, it's all about the whys. Why, 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 why? Why did you do it? Why did you choose to do this? Why did you choose to do that? I come from the school of thoughts that says that for every written, so now I'm talking textual, for every written work of art, every word has to audition for its place on the paper. So every word I believe that was chosen by the playwright had to have had a purpose. Why? Why did you choose to use this and not that? When I know what you know, the synonyms will have been, and why didn't, I, why didn't you use this when I know what the antonyms are? So by the time I'm done with actually masticating this play, as it were, when I mean, you know, chewing it and masticating it, then I, I think I have become, is that the best word to say? I have become, I have, the, the spirit of the work has merged with me. So when I now come in, I can hear, sorry, I don't want to go ahead because I, I, I will sound as if though I'm some crazy dude. <laughs> but <laughs> that being said, <laughs> so when I, when I come, I, the first meeting I have with my cast and my crew, I tell them, and we're, and we're always, I'm, I'm, I'm very much into village theater. When I say village, I mean, we're all equal. We all sit around the table. I'm asking the drummer, what do you think about it? Well, you know, and so a lot of artists who work with me, they, are, they feel insulted. What am I asking the drummer about? So what am I asking? They feel that ev ev everybody should have lines, you know? And I tell them, I say, this, these are our audience. This is our audience. Let us see how they, they got it. How they, so I'm, I'm asking questions. Did you get the idea we're trying to? Did you, how did it sound? Do you, can you, you know, and then they say, well, you know, I think that. So when I say I sell dramaturge, I do that with the village concept. That means people are also checking me as I am checking myself 
and as I'm checking the text, and as I'm checking the actor, and as I'm checking the director, which is now a separate entity for me. I don't know if you get that. So there is Jude, Jude the human, who has engaged this work of art with my prejudices, my prejudices, my biases, and all of that. There's Jude the director who has an overall directorial vision, knows what he wants to put on stage. There is, of course, the text as it were, whether it's written by me, if it's written by me, then there's Jude the playwright. And I know one thing about being a playwright, which I'm sure Aganza knows, is that the minute we write and the work leaves us, it is an entity in itself. So when you call the playwright and you're like, why did you choose this and choose that? And they bamboozle you, it's not true. They have no idea why they wrote it that way. If something happened to them at that particular point in time and the work, so I, I already know that. So I don't fool myself to think that there's always this technical reason why this was chosen or this was chosen. You know, sometimes you just smile and you say, oh, and they'll they say, wow, you're so intelligent to have done that. You know, you just, oh yeah, yeah, you know, I'm always intelligent, but you know that it's a chance. <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> so because I, and, and because I understand that, I understand the spirituality of the creative process. It helps me first and foremost, humble myself to be able to surrender to that process that happens when we take work from either idea or written um, concept in terms of a published play or even not a published play, a written play towards bringing it on, onto that stage. That sometimes the naughty issues, which they had to call Fumi for, the naughty issues which Aganza had to call some other dramaturge for, sometimes the drama, one chorister, the costumier, sometimes they have the, they have the solution. They are watching, they are seeing, and, but when you give them that open house, you know, that everybody can talk, come to me. There is no, uh, you have to go to the stage manager or whatever. Of course, I don't want a rowdy, chaotic, um, you know, group. Of, but ev everybody knows you can always walk to Jude and tell him, even the actors, Charles will tell you that, that you can interrogate me. Charles will say, Jude, I think we should, this whole page should go. And I'll ask him why. And sometimes I'll ask him, I'll say, are you sure it is not Charles, the actor who doesn't want lines talking, who is tired of lines? Or is it, you know what I mean? I try to find that truth in every decision, every confrontation with that art form. Why are we doing it? Are you sure, you know, filter yourself, just like how you're asking me to filter myself, you filter yourself so that we all come with our truths. And, and it's, I'm always happy that when this play is put on stage, if it's not authored by me, authored by someone else, the person comes, watches it, and the person's like, wow, I never saw it through this and the person says how did you picture it and i say well this actor was the one who actually spoke to me about you get what i mean that means i i am humble enough to understand that because i'm director doesn't mean that everything should come from me everything can be midwife about, by credit me. interesting yes so everything can be midwife by me but it doesn't have to be birthed by me so you have to bring it out into the open. And because I have an overall concept, I can now say, hmm, it's interesting how you, you know, so let's change this. Let's, because, they, because very few people have the overall concept. It's my job to have that overall concept. But once I can open up those avenues where every other person can engage with the work, knowing that their opinions are respected, knowing that we interrogate everyone's opinion and everyone's decision, then um, it helps that, that creative process come um, about so that I'm not only self dramaturging myself, everybody is also self dramaturging And I think at the end of the day, we get the best work possible. Yeah, so for me, it's spiritual. You surrender to the process. Uh, interesting. I know that Ganza's hand is up, so I'll allow Ganza to, to, to go ahead, Ganza. Yes, man, I'm about to jump off my seat. Uh, Jude, I have a question about the process. Because dramaturgy is time, and you said you research and you ask yourself all these why questions. And so when I am creating, I immediately want to jump into the rehearsal and, you know, start putting this thing out there. So how much time do you give yourself to research and dramaturg the heck out of your work before you share it with people on your team? I think first and foremost, for me, I'm great, great question, Aganza. For me, it comes from my discipline as a writer, from knowing that great writing comes from rewriting. So I have been schooled through that prism, knowing that the first time I engage the paper, it's not the best, it's not the best version of the work. I've always been able to 
finish what I'm writing, disengage from it, give myself other times of going to just be crazy and then coming back and reading it again and rewriting and read that. So, so that discipline has come. So it also follows me when I read a work. I read it and I distance myself again. And all the questions, the notes I make, I go and I go research the notes. I find answers and all of that. I come again and I read it again because sometimes the answers you're looking for are also in the work itself where you just haven't been exposed to the work enough to be able to find those answers. So I do that. And, it, 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 and I, I'll go back to being a writer. As a writer, sometimes you know when you should let the work go. You know when, okay, I think I've edited enough. I, I, I think it's enough to go. So I think that is the same way that I instinctively know when it's time to engage every other person, when it's time to take it there. And sometimes you see me, the first person I share the, the, the work of art with, or whether it's mine, self-authored, or someone, could be the lighting designer. And I say, hey, please read this. Tell me what you see light-wise. No other person has seen it. And they tell me that I see reds and yellows and all of that. Sometimes the music, you know, like the composer, because sometimes I need to hear the, the music of it. I need to hear the music of the play. Because I think, for me, I first distill it. And because I write multi-platform, I write poems, I write all of that. So it also helps me. So, so I shouldn't be like a guinea pig because I think I'm pretty strange. Well, so because I write all this, I write plays, I write films, I write songs, I write all of that. When I confront an idea, I ask myself, what should this idea go into the world as? So that I make sure I don't make the mistake of having an idea that comes to me and should be a song, making it a, a play. And there's the disjoint, you know what I mean? Or a poem or a short story, you expand it into a whole feature-length novel, you know? So I have to ask myself over and over again, what should this idea exist as? So I think answering your question, Aganza, it all comes from training, from the discipline of it. Because whether we like it or not, being an artist, being a talented person is 20% of it all. The other part is hard work, diligence, repetition, perseverance, you know, mastering of all your emotions, be it your primary emotions, secondary emotions, tertiary emotions, being able to put yourself through the fire, to discipline yourself. Because at the end of the day, we are existing beneath um, a cloud, like the ether of creativity and the ideas that are floating above our heads, it, it, it finds somebody to birth. And when it finds you ready to be um, obeisance to the sanctity of it. It embraces you. So that is how I, this I, guy, I approach my art. This guy. Um, <laughs> guy, is it just me? I know, I know. Is it just, is it just me? Oh my goodness. Oh, Jude, 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 come on. Well, I knew what I was signing up for. So <laughs> uh, uh, interesting, interesting metaphors, interesting process to your work. Um, I want the three of you to speak to when you're working across geographies. Um, wh what does that mean? For example, uh, for me, you've worked, you've worked in, the, in Nigeria, you're working in South Africa, in the UK, Jude, you kind of straddle Canada, Nigeria, Aganza, Uganda, and, and other places. What, how does that, what, what, what's the, the role of the place? The role of the geography, the time, the culture, the nuances of geography. What does it play in all of these things that are in all your process that you're talking about? Yeah, meaning meaning can shift from place to place. I mean, the common one is to say that whilst this means no in some cultures, this means yes in others. You know, that's a a, a, a brief way of sort of saying meaning shifts from place to place. But um, I can't really talk about geography until I've talked a little bit about process and, and the importance of process to understand understanding dramaturgy. So whether you're self-dramaturging, whether you're dramaturging someone else or co-dramaturging or using a dramaturg, um, it, it's effective when people understand the process of making theatre. Be because um, you can't you can't be an outside eye if you don't understand, you know, you know, for example, if someone brings you into rehearsal and they are doing a stagger through the first the first time they're trying to run the play, and then you start giving them feedback as if it's a finished product, 
you can actually crush the process. You have to understand that they are, they're just staggering through, they're doing the first thing, and your feedback should refer, refer to where they are in the process um, and the fact they're still flexible to be able to make some changes in a particular direction rather than you're giving them feedback the day before the opening night. You know, there's a difference. So it's understanding the process. And like Judy was saying, um, when I'm um, when I'm a playwright, I'm in that writing mode, then I move to this writing mode. So it's understanding the process and the different roles in theater. Um, like Anganza was saying that when she's making her own play, she needed someone to come in to, to, to ask her those questions, but the movement was hers, the text was hers, the performance was hers, but she's taking this other feedback because the person is helping her to go deeper into the into those processes. So the understanding the process of theater making and also understanding the conversations that go around the making of theater, why people buy into it, why audience buy into it, why someone wants to fund it, why they want to place it in a particular venue or not, why it's better to tour this piece or keep it on a in a place. So if the dramaturg sort of understands these processes too, so they're trying to institutionally um, help situate the piece, they understand what kind of conversation a funder is interested in. They understand, uh, you know, it's a youth theatre that is trying to engage you. They understand what the interest of somebody running a youth theatre is to someone who's running the national theatre, who has a different kind of um, agenda. And I, the reason why I'm bringing up all these things, because all of this has, has to do with um, uh, dramaturgy. And I guess the reason why the three of us are on this platform tonight is that we play multiple roles, because usually people who use dramaturgs or act as dramaturgs tend to do more than one thing, because they have to know how to what they have to know the feeling of what it means to be inside or outside and what it takes to nurture someone. You know, somebody can come on set and say, everybody move, and they feel they're nurturing you. They might feel, but because they don't understand the artistic process, they might actually shut down the people's confidence, you know, rather than open it up. So I'm just saying it's a prelude to if you're going into a different geograph geographical space, you go into a different space of translation. Because dramaturgy is a lot about dialogue, and sometimes dialogue is you're go using different languages. And when I say different languages, when like, like Jude gave an example, uh, if he shows his play to a playwright, um, to the lighting person, the guy, the guy goes, I see red, I see blue, ah, I see green. You know, it's a different language that person's going to say. If he shows it to the choreographer, they will say, oh, there's a lot of movement in act two. I, I really, you know, people are speaking different languages. And then, then the shift into, the geographical space and you're taking this play into a space do people how do people read movement in, in the next country who's going to help you um, find out what audiences here respond to and which venues would are the best venues because the venue has a marketing list and they're targeting a certain type of audience so which venue is best for this work in the same city, if you put it in one venue, it will fall flat. You put it in another venue, it will be a raging success because of who that venue is marketing to. So when you go into another geographical context, who are your, who are your guides to where to place it, to get the audience in, to the themes in the play, how to interpret that? Does it need much change or not? If you're circulating the same, you know, if you're circulating a certain circuit, it might not need to change, even in different countries. So if a, uh, a if I'm going to national theatres in different places of the world, then, you know, it might not be much change because the audience is open to that or the audience is quite literate in a certain kind of theatre and your work fits into that genre. But if you're going to a different circuit, so it's not just country, different circuit, I'm going to fringe venues. The audience there, that maybe they don't want something so polished. They don't like such, such polished work. They want work in which they could even somehow enter the stage with you. <laughs> Do you understand? I remember performing in Amsterdam. Someone came on the, on the stage and danced with us. 
and then got off. And we did, you know, it was a street performance. He felt he could do so, you know, and he would, that kind of person might not want to go to the National Theatre because he cannot get on stage with the performance and dance with them, you know? So, so it has a lot to do with understanding these processes. So when you shift geographical location, you start thinking in terms of the dialogues around theater and the processes of making theater. And where does the translation need to take place? Interesting. Aganza? Mm, me and I performed in New York and Abu Dhabi and Uganda and Nairobi. And I think whenever I shift place, the question that comes is, oh, will the audience understand? And as a director, I think I'm sort of a rebel because I'm not looking to change my piece to suit my audience. I want to see how my piece fits the audience. So I want to, I want to hear and see if they laugh at the same place Ugandans laugh to see if they cry at the same place Ugandans cry. I don't want to change my piece to suit their cultural content and sort of, you know, make it comfortable for them to understand, which takes me back to what we were saying, that foreground, background um, concept in a play. So does it change? If you change the place, does the meaning in, of the, in the foreground and background also change? And I think it does. To give an example, there was a musical I was rehearsing in New York and we showed it to our colleagues in New York and they were like, ah, nice, sweet, uh, very good technique, you know? And then we took it back to Abu Dhabi, which was the place, the piece was set with the jokes for the place and <laughs> with language of the place. And the response was so much more bigger. And, and so in that sort of way, the clandestine themes and motifs that were in the background came to the foreground when we took it to Abu Dhabi. And so as a director and thinking dramaturgically, I would say allow the piece to remain as it is and see how it, how it fits the context and the culture of the people in that place and how they derive meaning new meaning to your piece or attach their own meaning to it and see what kind of learning can be taken from there. Jude. Yeah, you know, Ganza was so very right and um, so also funny. And I think that, you know, there's a time and a place of external engagement when um, the work of art is, tra is traveling across borders, going to a new place, new geographical setting, which has its, its, its own um, cultural symboli symbolism as it were, how does it understand things, concept and all, but we still have universal um, themes of hunger, love, betrayal, those things that, you know, we, where, where, wherever it goes, people connect to it. But how, what is the journey of connection is where the concern is. What is like, you know, if you take a play to, um, you take a play to like Abu Dhabi or to an Arabic country, where you don't show people the bottom of your shoe because they find it highly insulting. And maybe in Nigeria, you know, if you know, showing you can sit down and put your legs, and all, all our parents, they do it, they come back from work, they sit down, next thing they do, they take their legs up, they put it on the chair or sorry, on a stool. It's nothing, it's not, but if you did that in that culture, it is insulting. So those, so those are the kind of tweaks that you you do because it's what it does it it's it causes misrepresentation in that um in that um, new geographical com um, confine but going to what aganza said it all also depends on what is the goal of your play is it to educate these people about a foreign culture for them to understand that the bottom of the shoe is not an insult in every culture do you get what I mean? So if you are going to educate them, then you have to show the bottom of a shoe in a context where it does not insult the people in the scene. And they, they're like, oh, in Uganda, you people do that. You know what I mean? So it also provokes a dialogue. And that also comes to play with what um, 
Fumi had said um, earlier in terms of institutional dramaturgy and you know the marketing dramaturgy, and you know, they are telling you this is the goal why we're taking your play from Kampala to Abu Dhabi. This is the reason. This is just like what, what we're saying here, decolonizing dramaturgy. When we saw the topic, we knew there is an agenda. So once you understand the agenda, why people are dropping money on the table to make sure your work of art travels, then you, you step in, you know, you come in, you, you, you fit into it. If you are not fitting into it, then you just stay home, you know? So yeah, so there's a place for all that. You know, for me as a self dramaturge I know when to also add that external person who gives a certain understanding or direction as it concerns. Because if I, was, if I was going to Scotland now, I don't know Jack about Scotland apart from their skirts and you know bagpipe and all of that. Is it Scotland or Welsh? Yeah, Scottish bagpipes and all. Yeah. So once once you know, so I, I now have to go to a professional, somebody who is more versed and say, hey, give me direction as regards A, B, C, or D. Give me understanding as regards this context, that context, or that context. And then I take that understanding, that guidance, and I bring it back into the work. And of course, I I, I morph or merge or do something to it to, to encapsulate that. But that being said, just like what Aganza, um, Aganza says, from even writing, I'll just give you a little analog um, analogy. When I, I write, as I say, I write novels and all. So, you know, when you write a novel, they tell you you have to italize foreign words or all of that kind of stuff. And I say, why do you not italize lasagna and you want me to italize a goosey or matoki? Why? And they're like, well, lasagna is popular. I said, no, if you go to Osho, Osho the market and tell a, a woman there lasagna, she doesn't understand what you're talking of. So you get what I mean? So I think that sometimes we also have to be able to stand for the greater politics, the greater identity politics, and say, we do not have to always explain ourselves. We do not have to always um, morph to be understood. If we can understand you without you morphing, then you can as well do the same for us. So there's an identity politics that also plays into the whole mix. And that has, that has to come either externally or from the inside. That means if you have enough authorial deep independence where you can decide what not and what not, because I'm sure there are some producers or you know, funding organizations who would just drop your play or drop your production if you're insisting on certain things. You know? But if in the case where you have certain liberties, I think you have to stand for um, the things that do not make you always trying to cuddle or explain. After all, we, we embrace um, Kabuki um, theater from Japan and you know all that stuff. We, we, we appreciate it. We, we, are, we, we come in contact with it and we say, okay, this is an external cost. This, this is a culture that is not ours. So we come to learn. So once your audience is there to learn, then you have to have the confidence to also teach and not apologize for or over explain that which you are or that which you're trying to show. As long as those things have been modeled or presented around universal themes that are understandable across borders and culture. Love is love, hate is hate, betrayal is betrayal, and all of that stuff. The minute you can capture that, the zeitgeist of it, then I think it's home selling free. I you, mean- you, Go ahead, Tommy, sorry, go ahead. No, I was just going to say, understanding how to translate doesn't mean you will necessarily um, have to, you would necessarily start pandering to the audience. It, it doesn't mean that. It, it's just like Jude was saying that you might, you understand, you understand the context into which you're entering and therefore you understand. For example, I am going to get my actor to put his feet on a stool and the audience is going to see the bottom of the shoe and they see this as an insult in this country. You, you're doing it knowingly. Do so I mean, if you just do decide to do it, you do it knowingly and you know how to frame your production, you know? So that, that is what um, it requires because then you can make, make those decisions. Um, and you, do, and you, know, you know, there was a situation in London, I think a few years ago where there was um, an artist who did a production um, at the Barbican and there was a riot. You know, um, he was doing depictions of, you know, the human zoos 
in um, that happened in colonial times where black people, people of color were exhibited in, in, in a zoo context, you know, and a group or a, an organized, a black led organization shut the pro production down. And, you know, some black people said, no, it should have gone ahead. We wanted to actually have the historical experience of it and of it. And they said, oh, but it's a white, it was a white director who, who staged it, you know, and he has no right to tell that traumatic history. It's not his history. So why is he telling the history? Um, I wondered, and it, so this is a high, I wondered if there had been other discussions prior to the discussion, prior to the staging of that, because there were black actors in it who, you know, they wrote an article saying the reason why they agreed to be in this production and they're performing in it is that it is a part of a traumatic part of black history and they wanted that history to be recreated and us to reflect on it again. So it wasn't everybody in the black, you know, it wasn't every black audience that didn't feel this human zoo should be staged. So I did wonder whether because of the type of story, there needed to be some communal discussion, you know, some educational project, some discussion where different groups, different black led groups may get to discuss this. Maybe they would have wanted to be in it or have some role in the curation of it for it to go ahead. So I'm talking about depending on the nature of your production, I do think there's a dramatic, because the production has political, social, cultural, spiritual ramifications and certain plays like, you know, really take it, you know, on the nose to the, you know, and in that case, if you look at yourself, and this is why sometimes one has to, as an, as an artist, you say, who am I? That's part of the dramaturgy. Who am I in the telling of this story? Um, and the artistic director, who am I in the telling of the story? Will, are there certain groups that will, will, will accept the story, but not you telling it? Then how do you mitigate that? So, you know, the, the whole thing of translating is understanding art and artists and processes, um, not necessarily to do everything to please the audience, but to know when those conversations need to be had or how to frame or where to give space for the audience to speak back. Is it a Q&A? Is it a workshop, you know, where they can have this, you know, engagement? Interesting. And, and the three of you, you've clearly kind of switched us to the second aspect of, 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 of you know, the, the intention of this, ep, uh, of this series itself by, by really using the, the idea of decolonization, right? you know, decolonizing dramaturgy. And, I'm, and my next question then for, for the three of you will really be to really speak to that. What does that mean for you? Or, and how do you, how do you see that? When we're calling for uh, in the first episode, one of the things, and for me, did ask me the question just to give you, you know, more context here. Why am I calling for drama to decolonize dramaturgy? And I said, well, I think for me, the main, you know, one of the basic thing I'm hoping that these can help us to uh, offer the opportunity to speak about bigger issues within the context of theater making on the continent and from theater, you know, makers, you know. Well, Africans, from, from, but, but live in other part of the world, um, and of course, considering you know the political, the 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 the, the aesthetics, the humane components of what it means to 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 put your performance and, and stuff on stage. So I, I think the prompt for the three of you to, and you've kind of started that already, and maybe I'll start with Jude. When you think of that, what does that when the calling for for decolonizing dramaturgy, what does that evoke for you? What ideas does that evoke for you, considering the fact that you've walked across, you know, different continents and you're still working? And of course, for Gaza, the same thing and Finland, the same thing. I just want to put that out there for three of you, and and then I also want to encourage our audience that are here to, you know, if you have questions, please feel free to uh, put that in the chat. It will get to us, and we can attend to that. Uh, over to you, uh, Jude. Yeah, thanks a lot, um, Tyro, for that. Um, yeah, for me, um, it's it's it comes to me when I saw that um, um, as the 
title, as you were, of this experience or this webinar or whatever we call it. I had said to myself, how do we decolonize dramaturgy? And first things, the first things that came to me was the amount of inherited paradigms within which we exist as people, both as people who are schooled through a certain, um, doesn't even have to be tertiary, right from our childhood, the kind of symbols, you know, the kind of books we learn with, they're all foreign. As if you go to a certain kind of school, which is basically, I think, I think it's just recently now that they're encouraging more African authorship in, you know, pre, well, I say pre-primary school, primary school and secondary school and all of that. But before then, we were reading the same books that children were living, reading in the UK or in Germany or in France for people who were coming from Frank Francophone Africa. And we, what happened to us was that we started looking at what was of us as inferior. And we started looking at being educated as being Western. We did not understand that there is something that has to do with your inherent or natural state of progress as it exists in the locale within which you were born. We even coined the phrase, they'll say, man, that person get native intelligence. And native intelligence wasn't as, even though it was as, it, it was, it helped you survive more in the locale within which you existed, but it wasn't something you were advised to have if you were crossing, if you were traveling to London, you say, ah, forget this, your native intelligence, or don't go there and go, you know what I mean? So, so when we decolonize, we have to first and foremost, first win the identity politics, which is what Fumi said and Anganza, first ask ourselves, who are we? Are we enough? Are we full? Are we complete as we are? Do we have anything to add into the global discourse of self that itself is enabling enough towards a higher purpose? Do we always have to take from the external? Do we always have to take to be added upon for us to become? Shouldn't we also contribute so that others too will become. So the minute we start understanding that, then we also start approaching dramaturgy from that same kind of construct by saying that if I'm going to do Death and the King's Horseman today, which I had, I'll just do a little um, analogy. Um, so they are adapting it for cinema, Death and the King's Horseman. It's actually being shot at the moment. And I was speaking to someone um, two days ago who, um, has some, you know, was speaking to the, I think the PA, I've forgotten the person on the set, but someone up there. And they were having this huge argument about the role of horses in the, transform in the ad adaptation of play to screen, that should there be horses? And a certain number of them were saying, no, they don't have, no, you don't have to put horses because the horse is a, symbolic, is a symbolic representation. It did not mean that the, the horseman actually had a horse, that it meant more like he was riding. I don't know if, you, I'm sure you guys have read, of course, Death and the King's Horseman, that it just meant he was the rider. It's just like when, when they say the, the four riders of the apocalypse, they don't, you know what I mean? That, so, but the question is, when you go to, um, to the locale that the play itself was set, you ask yourself, when the king comes out, the Oba comes out, how does he come out? Is there a rider? But the funny thing is that there's actually the riders. They're actually the horses that have garlands on them, beautiful embroidered um, clothes on them and everything. So in our culture, there's actually a representation of that horse. But these people who want to make this film are thinking of how the film would translate to the West, because obviously it is Netflix and Netflix is coming from America. So, even without, I don't know what the brief is, maybe Netflix said they should, but we find ourselves that even when we're not asked to do it, we're always thinking about how the Oyimbo will receive it. Our default is to pander, is to explain, is to apologize for, and all of that stuff. So when we start decolonizing dramatic, there are things we have to start asking ourselves. Do we also have our own body of thought body of understanding, constructs, ways. Because remember, how, how, did, theater, how did theater exist here? You know, I went to, to University of Nevada. When they start teaching us about theater, what did they start? Oh, um, um, thespian in Greek, in the Greek, whatever, in the this, in the that. 
Nobody's telling you how it started. You get what I mean? So even our schooling is already telling us that these things did not start from us. But we know because our parents have been, they, 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 they understood theater. Even just the worship of, Osho, of the Oshun River was, was theater. There was a space. There was an object. There was a goal. There were characters. What is a play again? What is a theatrical um, 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 performance if that is not it? You know, and there was actually an orgasmic experience that took place. So there was a beginning, a middle, and an end. You get what I mean? So we have to start coming back to the table and saying, hey, no, 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 no. Let's revise these things. Let's revise these things. These things that exist in your own uh, microcosm of thought also exist in ours. And now let's start comparing and appreciating ourselves across the aisle so that you will learn some things from us, just like how we've learned from you, you know, things like that. So I think that um, for me, as Aganza said, I haven't seen her work, but if you confront my work, it's the same thing you will see. I'll do another quick analogy. I did a play called Threesome here in Lagos, and um, it was a very sexually themed play. And I was going to, I was going to show sexuality without apologies. Because everybody was like, oh, Judy couldn't do that. I said I was going to put nude, I was going to put nudity on stage. And they said, oh, it's never been done in Nigeria. They will kill you, they will hang you by your neck, they will do all of that stuff. And I said, well, somebody has to do it. And it's going to be me. But I also understood how do I present nudity that it doesn't come across as nudity for nudity's sake. So I had to play, obviously, not only the politics of sex itself. I also had to play the gender politics. So if the woman was going to be nude, the man had to be nude. And I had to ask, my question, I had to ask myself the question, the embodiment or the visual of a naked woman, is it as contentious as the visual of a naked man? And I realized it is different. You get what I mean? <laughs> so I had to say, okay, so since it's different, how is it that I will show the naked woman and show the man in a sort of nude way that it ameliorates whatever argument will come. But at the end of the day, to cut a short story, um, long story short, I put the naked woman on stage. I put the naked guy on stage, but in a different construct of his, you know, what part of him you could see. And immediately, people appreciated it more. And when they were asking me questions, oh, Jude, how can you, how can I said, no, no. If you go to the villages, if you go to Benin Republic, to the market in Benin Republic, all the women are topless. They are topless because in our social systems, we never looked at the breasts as a sexual object. It was the West that sexualized it. The brazier, it's, it was imported, right? It was the breast that, you know, it was mammary glands. It was something to nurture the child and all of that. This, so I said, look, we cannot say that because these people say the Victorian, they have Victorian sensibilities, all prudish and tighty. You cannot say if they demonize sex, we should also demonize it for them to accept it. No, we have to introduce sex the way we saw sex. So I think that when we decolonize, decolonize dramaturgy, that's where we are coming from. We are coming first from the place of understanding who we are, understanding that we have a voice, understanding that we also have a, as glorified a body of knowledge as they have, that has, that has roots in our ancestry. You know? And then we also have to have the guts to say that we will do, come what may. And as they say, when something is repeated over and over and over again, the people that receive it have no other choice but accept it. Thank you. Uh, thanks, Jude. Uh, we just, uh, Aganza and, and for me, and maybe as you answer the question, there's a question in, in the chat already. Um, I know that, uh, thanks to Jude, he gave up some examples already. Um, in, in the context of the, the question that he's answering. But there's a question here that says, um, uh, so pleased to be part of this. Can any of the panelists share an example where production successfully consulted with a specific cultural community to develop and stage a production? I'm not trying to shift our attention away from the question on decolonized dramaturgy, but if there's a possibility to bring them together in your response with, especially with uh, examples, uh, that would be very helpful. And we have 10 more minutes to wrap up. So I want to respect your time. Uh, over to you, Aganter. And then after Aganter, we go to Fumi. Okay, thank you, Taiwo. I don't think I can comment on the question in the chat. So maybe Fumi or Jude can um, take that on. With regards to decolonizing dramaturgy, I think it's an opportunity. I say it's an opportunity because 
we have an opportunity to unlearn and learn new ways of uh, dramaturgy or dramatizing ourselves. At my school, I love teaching because our approach is to bring the Western techniques, you know, Meisner, you know, all these drama techniques and find their equal in a Ugandan context. And I love doing that in class because we say a word, um, very simple word, like gnarled. And, you know, in class, people be like, gnarled, what's that? Gnarled. <laughs> and so we'll find what it is in Luganda or whatever language the participants in the class are speaking. Or we'll take something in voice class, like saying, ah, what is ah in a Ugandan context? Ah, it's really cut and, and sharp. So we're taking these techniques and we're fashioning them for ourselves and sort of rewriting drama for ourselves because it's there we have it but for, perhaps we don't have the wording for it the knowledge for it so let us <laughs> let us write it for ourselves let us unlearn and rewrite for ourselves so i see it as an opportunity and i think jude hit the nail on the head but i'll say before we show them who we are, we have to show ourselves because there's a whole lot of decolonizing that has to happen generationally. We are ingrained in this. I was born into it. So before we, we take this out, I'd say we have to take it to ourselves and teach ourselves what we already have and show ourselves how to appreciate it from changing our books to our songs, our terms, our techniques, our definitions, our sounds, our pedagogy, <laughs> right from the roots, talking nursery and kindergarten and showing that we are enough. The, the storytelling we do around the fire that has a, a five act structure, a three act structure, that's enough. But let's, let's learn how to see the dramaturgical opportunity in it. Let's learn how to see the director opportunity in it, the playwright opportunity in it. And after we can embrace ourselves and, and our stories, then we can show it to the world in an authentic self without what Jude said, without apologizing, without explaining. <laughs> we take it with confidence. That's my two cents on that. Uh, for me. Well, wow, that was lovely to listen to because um, you both approached the same topic with different lenses, both very, very relevant. And um, yeah, I when I think of, I come very much from um, institutional context and I, maybe that's driven a bit uh, from my academic side. Dance companies, the National Dance Company started to be... Uh, um, started to be um, established in Africa, running up to the independence. A lot of companies ran their own national troops or, um, to project the identity of the independent nations. How many books have you read on a national dance company from Africa? I know someone's written on Senegal, um, Ghana, I don't think we've written very much. We have departments of theater arts all over Nigeria. We have so many universities in Nigeria alone. I know that there are directors, actresses, um, performers who have developed techniques of performance for the stage, for the television. Like Aganza is saying, Aganza is in the process of creating a form of pedagogy right now. And you know, the academic in me is, is very excited. But I know people have done that and there's no documentation. And there's Amatu Braid of Blessed Memory. She was doing her master's degree when I was a BA student and she created a technique which people used to call the Braidian technique. And she used to use rhythm to develop a rhythm scape into which she could incorporate several traditional dances and create you know, a quite a spectacular performance. 
and people were quite mesmerized with how she would bring dancers in and dancers out. She passed away. And as far as I know, that knowledge has gone with her, except if I managed to track down some of her students at University of Port Harcourt in, in, in the 90s. And we've, we've, we, we've all had with the coming of TV and the coming of a film and stage in Africa, we've had great performers and directors and choreographers who have created methodologies in order for their work to work in that context. Yes, they usually bring traditional methods and cultures and performance practices into these institutions, but they've created a method of using them there. Because we don't really name our processes and because we haven't really written history of television in Africa, history of theatre in Africa, history of, you know, we haven't written, written that, we let a lot of the knowledge we create disappear. Now, the problem I have with that is this. Young people born in Africa today were born there with television and the internet and mobile phones and film. If you tell them this came from the white man, they will just look at you. They grew up with it. Yet, when they want to read the history of it, they will probably have to refer, refer only to foreign counterparts. But we have actually run these institutions ourselves for at least 60 years post-independence. And we still talk as if we don't, we don't own them. We own them. Sorry, they're indigenized now. The way I run theatre in Nigeria is not the way I'll run it in England. There's an indig yes, we've taken a Western framework, but we've made it our own. If you talk, you know, we've made it our own. Traditional people who have never gone to, uh, you know, Western style school. They take, uh, they take, they've taken the stage, you know. Um, Herbert Oguinde, who was ran the first professional theatre in Nigeria in the 1940s, did not study abroad. He didn't go to Rose Bruford or Rada. You know, he learned some things from the church. He learned some things from masquerade performances. He created his own theatre technique. He sometimes went abroad and took summer uh, summer courses. But basically, it was what um, Jude called native sense that he used to create work that went international. That's His right. films went abroad and they came back. There's one book on the man. Laban, Rudolf Laban, Rush, a uh, German who created a system of movement analysis. I've read about 12 books on him alone, let alone Herbert Oguinde has one. He did several things, you know? And I think this idea, the, when I say the institutional modernity, we've absorbed so many uh, Western frameworks post independence, but we should stop calling them as if they belong somewhere else because we have used them. We've made them our own, we've created techniques, but I feel there's a problem in that we're not recording what people have done with them. And until we do that, we are going to feel um, we, don't, uh, we don't appear in these histories. Like um, Aganza was saying before we came on air that a lot of people do dramaturgy in Africa. They don't call themselves dramaturgy. Because they don't call themselves dramaturgy, what they do is not documented. It's not put in a book. It's not taught to anyone. And if someone wants to become a dramaturg, they have to make um, always take a foreign reference point. So that's where I'm coming from with this idea of, dram uh, of decolonizing dramaturgy. Like Aganza said, we have to decolonize it for ourselves and say who we are and what we've been doing with, with a Western framework of theatre, which we've adopted, we've adapted, we've made it our own. What have we done with it? I would like to know the history of that. I would like to see it documented. I'd like to see it taught. And then people can be happy. I like J Japanese buto. I, I also do some of that, but hey ho, I know, you know what my grandmother did in the village. Um, she was an amazing dancer. That also is a technique. Oh, well, interesting. We have just um, how many minutes? Just no more minutes to wrap up. So we have to wrap up now. Um, this is really exciting. Uh, Jude, do you have any last thoughts? I know that you were. we started on, on your note. Do you have any <laughs> last thing to say? I would um, totally just allow you to that question because someone was asking.
the, if there has been any successful uh, production where there was an engagement with the community. You had spoken about that. So you want to um, share that with them or if you want someone else to. I, I'm, I'm happy to, but does anybody want, I know that uh, Ganzet um, would love either you or, uh, you or, or uh, for me to share that. Does anyone want to share that? I don't want to take the space from both uh, the three of you. As to anybody, any of you, do you have any, any response to that question? Uh, so I, I would just jump in quickly. Go or you Jude, want me to go? Yeah, go ahead, Jude. If you have an uh, example, go ahead, please. Yeah, yeah, I could. I could. Um, okay, um, I, I would just share a, a, a quick example of uh, was an improvisational play um, of mine where we had to tell a story about um, a village in Baden, which is um, when I was in school, I just finished and I had to go back there to tell a story about a village where they were using, were trying to the reason why um, a lot of twins were being born in the community. Like it's, I think they've had, and they wanted to find out what the reason was and all. And the United, I think it was UNDP or one of them in UNESCO or something like that. They wanted to engage the community and in engaging the community, that's where community theater came. We had to first get their buy-in so that they open up to us to reveal to us what and what was the issue or what the reasons were. And before they were very host, not hostile, but they were very closed towards these, these foreigners coming to find out stuff about them. So I had to construct or conceptualize a play that showed that a futuristic play. So I wrote a play that posited that if you did help us, this was what and what and what, this is how it will look like if you and I work together. So I showed them the future in the present. And when we brought that into the community, some of them engaged with us. And at the end of the play, I remember the performance, once it was done, people were crowding to us and trying to explain to us, they know that, ah, Irony, that thing we showed is not, that's not the real reason. And immediately this information that the UNDP or UNESCO, I can't remember, one of the United Nations bodies have been trying for years to get from these people right there that night in short, they were like, we've gotten so much information now, we don't even know what to choose. But we had to show them what their engagement with us will look like in terms of what the future will look like. And all I just needed was a couple of them, like, you know, the village head and all those kind of people, people in leadership, to accept me coming with this theater um, concept to share it with the entire village before it, um, it, um, it totally got embraced and the solution was God. So I think that can answer that question and the uh, it, uh, time where um, I engage the community. You just need some certain um, key policy holders. Once those ones engage with you, then they introduce you to the community. Community embraces your, if your work is all inclusive, it does not denigrate the right against their customs and all of that. And then it shows them what the future will look like. Those were the things that I did. And, you know, we're respecting their culture, using their languages and their idiomatic expressions and symbols and all of that. And you could see even after they played, they were coming back and they would say, that's that rapper that the lady wore, she was supposed to tie it up here, not here. And we say, oh, sorry, we didn't know. Now we know next time we'll tie it. And when we did the next presentation the next day, they saw that we had made all those ad adjustments based on the feedback they gave us. And immediately they were telling us, when next are we coming? They're going to bring people from the next villages. And we ended up at something that was supposed to be for a short while. We ended up staying so far because they wanted to take us everywhere. So I think it's wonderful when the community buys into um, whatever you want to do the theatrically, because you show them that they are worthy of some, they are worthy of being studied, they are worthy of being documented, as what Fumi said, which is very, very important, that documentation. So the minute we told them that oh, we've recorded it, we're writing about this stuff, and they were telling us, oh, when we bring it, they want to give it to their children because their children now nowadays, they just want to go to the, the city and forget about what was done in the village. So I think it's, 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 it was a great experience, and I hope that there'll be other forums where um, I can re replicate that engagement and any other person out there who's listening can also um, replicate it. So always remember, it's all about respect. Respect the people, and they will embrace you. No, thank you so much, Jude. And to add, ladies, just to say that I think the ethics of co community engagement, 
the ethics of knowledge generation and knowledge mobilization so that even whatever we document it always go back to the people not like you know so that it's not like it becomes extractive those are all those ethical issues that really make those kind of engagement and partnership very successful i'd like to say thank you to the three of you aganza for me and you thank you for taking the time we're five minutes ahead of our time my apologies to our viewers and to the three of you and to to brendan and and uh, sarika and, and of course to akira a captioner thank you so much uh for taking the time to be here today um we look forward to seeing you next week um for the fourth episode which is going to be recorded uh we've recorded it already we're gonna, we're gonna play it um it won't be the same like uh, this live Q&A session, we're gonna edit next week. Um, thank you so much um, to all of you and um, we really appreciate you for your time, for your resources and your thoughtfulness. Uh, on my end, I'll see you next week um, and bye.